All right, so let's get constructive. Um, the the first aspect of Christology in the contemporary period that we have to reckon with is the fact that we have to have a Christology that can um, survive the, I don't want to call it the death of the soul, but the reconsideration of the soul. I mean, you'll recall from last week, one of the major issues that we dealt with was the fact that our anthropology, uh, our contemporary anthropology has tr changed dramatically from uh, the classical period to the present. And the, and the biggest um, sea change that's taken place is the reconsideration of the soul. There are a whole lot of Christians and non-Christians now who don't believe in anything like a soul. They'll, they'll just say, no, and when you say soul, what you mean is functioning brain, functioning embodied brain or something like that. Um, and, and there's, you know, we saw last week, there's some good reasons for that. Even if we want to, you know, hold on to a notion of the soul and of dualism, we still have to come to terms with the fact that we are embodied beings. And Jesus was too. You know, that, if you'll recall the, the, the rational soul way of going about things, I don't mean to draw it. The rational soul way of going about things, it's almost like, you know, there's this God inside the machine, there's like a little invisible pilot who's, you know, driving Tom. And so we, all we have to worry about is that invisible pilot. We don't have to worry about Tom's arms, legs, um, stomach, heart, whatever. Those are just, those are incidental, they're accidental to who Tom is. Contemporary anthropology, you know, basically categorically denies this and says, hey, even if you believe in a soul, um, that soul is radically dependent, possibly emergent from the the body, and, and when we say body, I mean you know capital B body, like the whole shebang. And we probably would want to put some priority on the cognitive processing equipment um, in the brain, but not exclusively. Like we want to say, hey, we're we're aware now that perception changes when you're hungry. <laughs> you know, uh, there's such a thing as hangry. It's real. Um, deprivation, you know, makes abstract thought harder like we, we we know these things based on a lot of different studies and so we want to treat the human being holistically and when we start to think about the implications of that for christology we kind of recognize that we're not as concerned about you know what kind of soul jesus has as we're concerned about how it is that um, the divinity of god could be manifested and realized in some form in a in a body like this right in a person like this you know jesus had a brain jesus had a heart jesus had stomach arms legs jesus could be physically wounded and could die um jesus experienced and we know this we know that jesus experienced hunger he fasted uh, and that changes you know your ability to see think and perceive in in, in real ways so what would it look like um, what kind, what does theology have to say if we're not sitting around just talking about like this soul that's like plopped into the person and kind of runs things, and um, and part of this is the big tent, right? If you want to maintain a big tent um, Christology, you have to be able to have a Christological account that's satisfying for people who are skeptical at least about souls or who want to say that souls are radically dependent, possibly emergent from bodies. And to do that, um, the very fir the first notion that we have to kind of embrace is is pneumatology. We have to re-embrace uh, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Um, we've talked a little bit about the Holy Spirit in this course, um, primarily when we're talking about the doctrine of God to say that the Holy Spirit is um, sort of God's imminence to the world, right? Um, the Father sort of is a transcendent and and a beyond, but the Spirit is um, the one who mediates uh, God's will and the person of the Son to the world. And, 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 and what we might want to do is kind of recognize that, especially in the 20th century and the 21st century, um, Christian theology has kind of been slapped in the face of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit had been sort of <laughs> like, I don't know, like the sort of the, the kind of ignored member of the Trinity um, until the Azusa Street revivals in the early 1900s, and and now with um, charismatic and Pentecostal congregations, and academic theology followed and started to recognize how much the Spirit had been ignored, and yet how much the Spirit features so prominently, especially, especially, especially in the life of Jesus. Um, at all of the major inflection points, 
you know, the spirit is a person, you know, either the dove or the one um, who uh, mediates the, the conception of, of Jesus. The spirit is, is what you might say, tabernacled or especially present in and through the person of Jesus. Um, to, to the point, right, where at the end of, at, when Jesus dies on the cross, what does it say? He gave up his spirit, right? There's the sense that the spirit has been deeply, deeply involved in everything that Jesus has done. In, in, in some ways, conceptually speaking, the Holy Spirit or a pneumatological Christology, um, a spirit Christology, is, is the, the contemporary replacement for the abstract divine nature that, that was, that's uh, somehow a part of Jesus' soul, right? Um, remember in, in classic peri perichoresis, what, there's, the human, there's the human nature over here, uh, the human soul, the rational soul, and then there's the divine soul, and they're like, and they're, they're, they're per perichoretically, not soul, I'm sorry, natures in one soul. They're perichoretically uh, inter intertwined. Well, if you think about contemporary accounts of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it kind of seem like that's sort of the description that we get for the way that the Holy Spirit mediates and intervenes, intervene may not be the best word, but guides, nudges, um, is present to and participating with the created order. Right? There's this sense that, you know, that the Holy Spirit is present to all that is happening, all that's going on. And the Spirit is initiating and is creative uh, and is, is pushing and nudging and pulling um, all of the, the created order in, in various ways. And it, what we might imagine then is that the, the Christ, the, the second person of the Trinity, the way that the second person of the Trinity um, can or does assume the, the, the person of Jesus of Nazareth is in the spirit. It's the spirit that um, that kind of mediates between the eternal second person and this human man Jesus and brings the two together such that everything that the human man Jesus does is the work of the second person of the Trinity such that the eternal second person becomes known as the Son such that the eternal second person uh, is Jesus Christ. It's only in the unity and the mediation of the Spirit bringing the eternal to uh, the temporal that we get divinity at all. Meaning that there may not have been anything special about Jesus' body, right? At least not until it's glorified. Jesus' body and Jesus' humanity really were like ours. Just fully um, in the Spirit is the uh, the language that the, the, the text uses. Right? The, the Spirit descends like a dove. The Spirit you know, is on him. The Spirit is, of the Lord is upon me. Uh, and, and fully and completely mediating, not completely, fully and limitedly mediating the nature and character of the second person to and through um, Jesus of Nazareth. And so you could say, yeah, conceptually, that new, spirit Christology is a recognition that Jesus does not do, Jesus is not Jesus apart from the spirit. There's nothing, there's no part of Jesus' life that is independent of the spirit. Everything that Jesus does is willed by God and empowered or enacted, enfleshed in and through the spirit such that you could say um, that Jesus was in the Spirit or of the Spirit uh, from conception um, to death and then once again in resurrection. So the Spirit is the one that em is the one who empowers uh, the resurrection and remediates or glorifies uh, the, the body of Jesus of Nazareth um, to once again be Jesus, uh, to once again be the eternal manifestation the manifestation, I'm sorry, of the eternal second person of the Trinity. 
one of the things that this does is it makes our um, Christology much more Trinitarian, right? It, on the classical view, I'd say one of the one of my concerns about the classical view is it doesn't seem like Jesus needs the Father or the Spirit, right? Jesus seems to be like his own guy. <laughs> uh, he's got you know he's got his divine nature, his human nature. Jesus is good. A spirit Christology says no. Um, were the Spirit like a hypothetical would be if the Spirit were to be any less present any less than fully mediating the Godhead to humanity at any point from the conception to the death and the resurrection of the Son, the Son, Jesus would, there would be no Jesus. Jesus can't, Jesus isn't Jesus apart from uh, being in and empowered by the Spirit. And I think this is kind of like a, a it's a more biblical and theological way of getting to the point that Crisp made in uh, his um, discussion of perichoresis um, that the classical view needs to have the divine and human natures to be inseparable right and the way that we do that when we're not we don't, we don't have soul language to depend on anymore is the way we can talk about that is we can say um, that every aspect of Jesus every every characteristic and, and part of the, the eternal son's nature that is eternal person's nature is made manifest in the Son of God in Jesus Christ is through the Spirit. The Spirit actualizes it all. So you could imagine, I mean, if you imagine the Spirit is like glowy, you know, force stuff, it would mean that Jesus is glowy, like glowing the entire time. What we see in the Transfiguration is always there latent, but in the, transforma in the Transfiguration we see the glory of God manifested through the Spirit, or at least Peter um, James and and, uh, and John do, they see it, that manifest, or at least more manifest than they normally do. And so what they're really seeing is they're seeing um, the spirit of God, you know, manifest more of uh, the the glory of God in and through Christ. It also means that when we're reading the Gospels, we can look any any place where we see Jesus living and acting. What we're seeing is the living action of the spirit of God the liberating freeing healing redeeming spirit of god uh, we see all of the activity that jesus undertakes is the activity of the spirit so contemporary christology point number one pneumatological it's got to be a spirit christology <laughs>